Well, good morning, church family. This is Palm Sunday. It is obviously a much different Palm Sunday than what you and I are generally accustomed to. We will miss watching the children come up and lay palms on the communion table toward the beginning of our service. We were hoping to be able to meet together this coming Easter Sunday, but it looks like we will not be able to have uh, that worship service together to observe Easter. So it's going to be a much different format than we've been accustomed to in the past. Lord willing, we'll have a live stream next Sunday for Easter service, but in the meantime, this is the format in which you and I find ourselves together. Let's open up in a brief word of prayer before we get into the scriptures here this morning. Heavenly Father, we ask that as you guide and direct our hearts here today, we ask, Father, that you will enable us to set aside uh, some burdens and some concerns that we have in our current times, Father, and just enable us to, to surround ourselves around your word today, Lord. Father God, we ask that your spirit will enable us to understand the words that you have preserved for us, Father, for our learning and for our instruction, Father, and for our correction. We pray, Lord, that as we engage your word here today, Lord, that we will not be merely hearers of your word, but we will resolve ourselves to be doers of your word as well. You're a kind and good and gracious God. We love you this morning, and we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible, and I hope you do, I want to invite you to joining to the joining me in turning to the 126th Psalm. Psalm 126. Six verses. I'll read through the text, and then we'll go back and work our way through it here this morning. The 126th Psalm. A song of ascents. When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. And then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. And then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seeds of sowing, shall doubtlessly come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, when we work our way through life, there are times when life can become difficult and it become frustrating, times when we question ourselves, and when occasions like that happen to us in life, there's a tendency on the part of you and me to want to go back to a time in our life when things were a whole lot simpler. For some of us, maybe we wish we could go back to being a kid. Life was simple, life was fun, and we didn't have the cares and concerns and the burdens that we have here today. There's nothing wrong with going back to, to enjoy the good times and to reflect on those, but the problem often results with you and I when we come back to reality. We're faced with the same problems that we have, and we haven't really processed how to understand the times that you and I live in. Life can become very discouraging at times. The 126th Psalm is, in some sense, a psalm that goes back to the good old days. But it brings them to the reality of the present, and the psalm ends with resolve on how to understand the, the present times that the, the Israelites were, were presently in. So when we look at the 126th Psalm, we can divide this up into two sections. Verses 1 through 3, we can see how you and I can be encouraged by what God has done. And then looking at verses 4 through 6, you and I can process the here and the now. You and I can be encouraged in what God could potentially do for you and I here in the future. Let's look at verses 1 through 3 here this morning. The Israelites in verse 1 are saying here, the psalmist is saying, When the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. These are the Israelites who found themselves in bondage and deported to Babylon. The superpowers had changed, and over the time with the Medes and the Persians, the Israelites were still in captivity, and this captivity lasted for a period of about 70 years. It was like a dream when the Israelites found themselves being allowed to go back to Jerusalem, to go back into their land, and to go back into their home, and to go back with their families. It was like a dream to them, one, because it happened very quickly, and two, because this was unheard of in ancient times. When, when rival superpowers went to war and when they conquered a rival nation, one of the first things they did was they began to deport the people and they would absorb them into their empire. They would separate these people and in one sense divide and conquer. 
They would intermingle them with other people groups that they had, had conquered. And the purpose behind this was to destroy the unique identity that these people had. If we can destroy their culture, if we can destroy their unity, and in some cases, if we could destroy their language and make them into a new people group, they will be a lot easier to manage. And so the idea of, of the Medes and the Persians releasing the Israelites who were in captivity for 70 years and allowing them to go back, you can understand from the perspective of the psalmist, this is like a dream. This is something that just doesn't happen. And there's a reason for that in ancient times. If you were to divide and conquer a nation and then allow them to regroup and go back, there's more than likely what's going to happen, and I call this the three R's. The first thing is they're going to rebuild as a people group. The second thing that they're going to do is they're going to regroup. And the third thing they're going to do is probably going to get their revenge. So if you as a conquering nation allow these people to go back, you'd better be prepared to look over the sh your shoulder the rest of your life because these people are probably going to come for you eventually someday. So it was almost like a dream that these Israelites couldn't believe that they had been released and allowed to go back home. When we look at this here, notice verse 2, their mouths were filled with laughter and singing. Uh, it says here in this particular text that they were experiencing real joy. You know, there's something to be said about when people have been discouraged and they've been frustrated and they feel like they've been run down to be able to laugh again and to sing. You know, that reminds us of a, of a passage of scripture, laughter is good medicine for the soul. And indeed, these Israelites had great occasion to celebrate and to laugh and to sing to the Lord. But notice here also in verse 2, there's a sober acknowledgement on the part of the Gentiles that God had done this for them. Notice the latter part of verse 2, and it said, And they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. On the part of the kings, it's interesting, if you read through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, you'll find pagan kings such as Cyrus, such as Darius, and such as Artaxerxes, uh, recognizing that this is from the hand of God. It doesn't mean that these pagan kings were, were worshippers of the one true God. It doesn't mean that they had faith and that they believed and the one true God, it just simply means that they acknowledge that this was the hand of God, that they go back to Jerusalem. It acknowledges the fact that God even used these pagan kings to accomplish his purposes. And it's fascinating to see that these kings would not only write decrees of releasing these people, the Israelites, back to Jerusalem, they would issue decrees such as giving them building material to rebuild the, the gates of the city, or that they would give them decrees of safe passage, and that if anybody was to obstruct them, then they would incur the wrath of the king themselves. But there's also something else to keep in mind here when we see that the Gentiles acknowledge this is from the hand of God. There's a passage in Nehemiah, chapter 6, verse 16, and it reads, And it happened when all our enemies heard it, and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. These were people that were committed to being the enemies of the Israelites, but yet even they had to admit that this occurred by the hand of God, being released from captivity. We also see in verse 3 that the Israelites rightfully acknowledged that this was from the hand of God. Notice verse 3. The Lord had done great things for us, and we are glad. The Israelites were, were wise to remember that it was by the hand of God that they were allowed to go back to Jerusalem. They didn't make this happen. There's no way that the Israelites could, could rely on their resourcefulness, on their cleverness, or that they made something like this happen. This was by the hand of God that he allowed his people to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild. And so what's the takeaway for you and I here when we look at verses 1 through 3 and we look at the time that you and I live in? You may say to yourself, I've never been a slave, I've never been a, a captive, I've never been released, so I, it's difficult for me to have the same joy that these Israelites had. I would encourage you to go back and look at your salvation. In other words, look at the initial point in your life where you would come to a, a saving, redemptive relationship with God through Christ. Scripture says that we are once slaves to sin. Scripture says that we were at one time dead in our trespasses and that we were by nature children of wrath. 
I would say that we indeed have been released from a time of captivity, a time of being in bondage and sin. When you stop and think for a moment the, the extent and the depth of our own depravity, our depravity mars us to the core of our being where we're helplessly lost. We have no ability in and of ourselves to, to repent and turn to Christ on our own. God is the first mover and in his, in his graciousness and in his kindness and love. At some point, he reached out to you and I in our lives. And he summoned us into a redemptive relationship with him. That should give you and I a great occasion to be joyful. But we also know that initial conversion experience, you observe or talk with people who come to a, a saving knowledge of Christ uh, over a period of time, that excitement and the newness can wear off. Just as the Israelites here, they were allowed to return back to Jerusalem. In the initial excitement and the newness of being released and set free and being able to go back home, that excitement wore off because now they have to deal with the harsh realities. They have to work the land. There's the harsh realities that life for them probably won't be the same. There's the harsh realities of knowing that there's still the times of the Gentiles and that there are still ruling nations around them that can do as they please and there's probably little they can do about it. You and I as followers of Christ, we at our initial point when we come to know Christ, that probably was a very exciting and, and, and a wonderful time in our life. But then we begin to realize we have to battle our flesh. And this is an ongoing battle. And at times, for some of us, it's a very difficult battle. Maybe it's just simply acknowledging the, the matters of life, family, and work. And as a follower of Christ, how am I to embrace these vocations that God has given to me? Let me fast forward a little bit and bring it into the times of, of you and I here today. As of recently as three, perhaps maybe four weeks ago, things were fairly good in our country and in the world. We live in a fallen world and we have a lot of problems in our country. We, we know that. But... Life was a little bit simpler then than it is now, today, here in our setting where you and I live in. Our church, speaking personally of Zion, it seemed like we had some good momentum that was starting to pick up here in church life. We took on six new members uh, three or four weeks ago, and now all of a sudden we can't meet together because of this, this virus that's been going around. We have to practice a shelter in place. We have to practice social distancing. And maybe these realities today could get you a little bit discouraged and frustrated. Maybe the events that you see in the news can raise the level of anxiety that you, you didn't have three or four weeks ago. Verses 4 through 6 can give you and I a helpful perspective on how we should look ahead and we can be encouraged in the things that God could potentially do in our lives individually as well as within our church life here corporately at Zion Church. Notice here in verse 4, first thing we should do is pray. Verse 4 here, we have sort of an, an interpretive challenge. I don't sure, I'm not sure what Bible translation you're reading. I'm reading New King James, and mine is worded this way. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. From the surface, it sounds like the Israelites are wanting to go back into captivity with the, with the Gentiles, but that's not the case here. If you're reading the New American Standard Bible, that phrase might be rendered like this. Restore our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Or if you're reading the ESV, it might be rendered like this. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Or if you're going to read the, the NIV, that phrase in verse 4 would be rendered like this. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. The prayer is simply this. The Israelites are praying for a quick prosperity in the land. They're not preoccupied with money. They're not uh, preoccupied with material possessions. And that's not what they're asking for. They're simply praying that the fruit of the land would be as it once was. Just as quickly as the Israelites were released from captivity... The, the psalmist is using a, a phrase or a, uh, something from their language of their time period that their readers would have definitely re resonated with here. As streams in the south. So, in other words, this is a desert area. We're talking primarily of the Negev Desert. It is a, a barren and, and dry land. There's a different life form as far as plant and animal life that's out there. But for the most part, it's desert. It's very dry. 
but there are times when seasonal rains will come or there will be rare occasions where a sudden downpour, a, a thunder shower will happen. And when that happens, these stream beds that are laid throughout the land or in mountainous areas where they have these wadis or they're like valleys, all of a sudden flash flooding can come very quickly. And on some occasions it can actually be very dangerous. The psalmist's prayer here is that God would prosper them and that he would restore what they once lost at one time and that he would restore it very quickly. This is a, a good thing to pray for. We, we, the psalmist teaches you and I that we can pray in the midst of maybe our difficulties and frustrations here today. We can pray that God would resolve this, this plague, this COVID-19 virus that's going around. God would resolve this quickly. Doesn't mean that he necessarily will, but it is right and it's good that we pray that he could. It is right and good that you and I pray that God could restore a time when we can fellowship together and we can worship together here at Zion Church in the Lord's house. It, it is right and good that you and I could pray that maybe someday soon the Lord could restore very quickly a time when we can gather together in each other's homes and not have to wear masks to, to protect ourselves from some of these pathogens that are, that are going around. It is right and good, and there are many other things that you and I can pray about. But the first one here, and this is not an exhaustive list, it is right and good that you and I pray. We can be encouraged in what God has done. We also see here in verse 5, we should work. Notice here in verse 5, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Those who sow, in the process of re-inhabiting the land, the Israelites were going to have to go back to work. And granted, it would be difficult work. They would sow, indeed, in tears. But they're going to have to go to work. What, what we need to remember here in the time that you and I live in, this is not a time to become comfortable. This is not a time or day and age for you and I to, to quit and to become overly discouraged. This isn't a time for you and I to give in, perhaps, to, to fear and anxiety. If anything, this is really a, a time to work. And there's a lot of things that you and I have, have to work on. As followers of Christ, our personal sanctification, that is plenty of job security for you and I to do every day that God has us on this side of eternity. We will always do battle with the flesh. We will always do battle uh, trying to live a life that pleases and honors the Lord on this side of eternity. We have to be busy working when it comes to our sanctification. Church life, member care is going to be difficult now. It's going to be different. And, and we're still learning how to do this without having contact with each other. But we, we need to be busy in the work of caring for one another. That could be more phone calls. That could be more text messages. That could be more sitting down and handwritten cards, notes of, of encouragement, notes of comfort to people who may be alone or who may be hurting. Our outreach is going to be different. I don't know how we're going to do that. We may have to rely a little bit more on social media than, than we have before. But all of these things combined together, they're going to require work and effort on it, your part and mine. These things aren't just going to happen on their own. And so there's a balance of, yes, God is indeed sovereign here, and we know that. But we also have the aspect of human responsibility. And God has given us plenty of tasks for us to be busy with here as a church and as individual followers of Christ. And he's given us his word to guide and instruct us. And he's given us his spirit to, to help guide and direct us as well. We need to pray. We need to work. Notice also here in verse 6, we need to believe, trust, and hope in the unchanging goodness of God. Notice here in verse 6, He who continually goes forth weeping, Bearing seed for sowing shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. When we look at verse 6 here, we are again reminded that what God has done in the past, and again, this is from the perspective of the psalmist, God has delivered his people from captivity and he's restored them to their land. If God's done this in the past, he can do it again. Us here, modern day, if God has worked in your life in a very unique way, either to provide for you as a family or as an individual, God has protected you, God has, has guided you in some way in the past, He can do it again. 
Look at our church family here, Zion Church. We could probably look back at the history of our church and count numbers, uh, numerous times when God has provided for us incredibly, or where God has protected us as a church family, or God has provided things that we've needed as a church body. If God has done this in the past, he is certainly capable of doing it again. And God will choose to do that in the way and in the time and in the manner that he so chooses. But it is right and good for you and I to look back at what God has done. We can trust him, we can believe in him, and we can hope in him. And hopefully these things will encourage you and I to live and understand the times that we live in here today. Plenty of work for you and I here to do as a church family. And there's plenty of opportunities that God has given you and I to exist for him, to serve him, to serve one another in his name and on his behalf, and to reach out beyond the walls of our church and our community, perhaps just starting with our neighbors. Maybe it's starting with, with people, acquaintances that we have that, that are not churchgoers and they don't know Christ. There are plenty of unique opportunities that God has given you and I to serve him and to exist for him here today. I pray and I hope that some of this is encouraging for you as a church family, but I wouldn't want to close out this text this soon without assuming that everyone who is watching and listening is a, a true follower of Christ. You know, this, this message here has been geared primarily to those who are followers of Christ. The church is for believers, ultimately. But perhaps you're watching this here this morning. And you may have been pondering your own soul. Maybe you would have to be very honest and transparent with yourself if you do some deep soul searching. And you'd have to acknowledge that you're not a follower of Christ. Maybe you've been watching a lot of the events in the news and some of this has, has raised your anxiety level. And maybe some of this has, quite frankly, scared you. That's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. And so as a church family, we would corporately implore you, we would, we would reach out to you and implore you to be reconciled to God because there's something far worse than this plague that we're seeing here in our times on COVID-19. There's something far worse than that, and that's sin. And ultimately, there's something far worse than, than dying on this side of eternity. Dying in your sins is absolutely horrible. That should be terrifying. And so we're reminded of the passage of Scripture that Jesus said in John chapter 3. Unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God, nor can he enter the kingdom of God. We would, uh, we would implore you here this morning, carefully, prayerfully consider your eternal destiny. There's nothing on this side of eternity worth wasting and squandering your life on, only to be separated from God for all eternity. And so we would ask this morning that you would prayerfully, prayerfully look into your own heart. We are asking that you would pick up a copy of the scriptures. Read, read John chapter 3. And as you're reading that particular text, pray and ask God that he would open your eyes and help you understand the words that you are reading. Pray that God would help you not only understand the words that you're reading, but just pray that God would give you the, the ability to repent. Pray that God would give you the faith to believe so that you too could have the same hope, the same assurance that of not being in a right relationship with God and truly being born again, being a follower of Christ. This would be our plea to you from, from Zion Church. Let's close this morning in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the things that you revealed to us in your word, Lord. With you are the words of life. and We have no place else to turn. Father, I just pray that our, our church family would rally around your word. I pray, Lord, that our church family would draw near to Christ and that you will enable us to accurately understand the times that we live in here today, Father. And Lord, I just pray that as you work and move in our lives individually, Father, that you will make us stronger as a church family, even in the midst of this virus that's been going around, Father. And Lord, we pray that if there's somebody who's watching this for the first time and perhaps something that was read from your word and from scripture here would be used to, to stir their heart, Father, and they don't know you, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would be gracious and kind and that you reach down and that you would call that person to a saving relationship with you, Father. We love you this morning. We thank you for being God. We thank you for always being seated in the throne. 
And Zion Church will continue to keep your word and to keep your son and to keep the gospel first and foremost in church life. We love you today and we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day.